Alam tara annahum fi kulli wadin yahimun. This is an expression in the Quran describing poets. And to first, let me give you an easy translation of Alam tara annahum fi kulli wadin yahimun. Describing the poets, Allah says, Don't you know, didn't you see, that they venture off, they wander off into every valley. They wander off into every valley. A couple of things I want to share with you about the word Hama Yahimu. Hama Yahimu is used for a camel when it's looking for water and it's dying of thirst and it's just wandering in aimlessly in any direction. That's Hama Yahimu. Al Hiyam is also used for love that can get you killed. <laughs> Al Hiyam is deadly love. The Arabs have, they, they have 10 degrees of love in their language. There are 10 degrees of love. The tenth one is al hiyam This is the tenth one. And this is the love that gets you killed. You know, somebody commits suicide because of love, that would be hiyam. Somebody takes an overdose because of love, that's al hiyam You know, somebody's killing themselves with depression over love, that's al hiyam Somebody, al hiyam could be some, a mother who's killing herself with stress over her son. It could be some guy who loves this girl, but she doesn't like him and he's killing himself. That's al hiyam it's deadly. So the tenth form of love is actually unhealthy. It's, you don't want that. It's kind of a disease. It'll kill you. The one below that, the ninth one, which is the highest you can go if you don't want to die. Okay, the highest you can go is called al-wala. Wow, lam and ha. Al-wala. And al-wala is actually also argued to be the same as hamza, lam and ha from which we get La ilaha illallah. So the wala and ilah are related to each other. Meaning one of the, one of the meanings of ilah is actually the object of love. And any, any more love than that and you would what? You die. And wala is a kind of love, even though that's not the subject right now, but wala is a kind of love that when you have it, you don't feel pain anymore. Meaning you're really hungry, but because of your love of something, your love of waiting for, you know, you're waiting for, you know, the, I'll give you the example of the mother at the airport again. The mother's waiting for her son to arrive. She hasn't had lunch, but she doesn't feel hungry because the son's coming. So that love that fills you, even though you have a need, it's not felt anymore. That's wala. And that's when we say, La ilaha illallah, our iman in Allah and our ibadah to Allah is supposed to be filled with so much love that we don't feel, we don't feel like we're missing anything in life. We're just not missing it. That's one of the meanings of ilah. Anyway, that's on a side note. Coming back to Yahimun. So it's a killer love, a love that'll kill you, get you, drive you to insanity, where you will be compared to a wandering camel that's looking for water and is about to die. Okay? Now Allah gives this description for poets. Didn't you know that they venture, venture off into every valley? Now the thing is, Going into, why even mention a valley? The Arabs had this figure of speech, Hama fi kulli wadin. He ventures off, meaning he, this guy goes everywhere aimlessly, pointlessly. And he doesn't even know what kind of danger he's putting himself into. I want you to visualize the image here. There's a valley, which means to enter the valley. Do you travel upwards or downwards? You have to travel downwards. You're up high on a mountain, you're traveling downwards. Which means your original position was up and your final position will be? Down and up, being up is associated with being honored, having dignity, having respect, and putting coming down is associated with humiliation. So now the poet is being described as someone who's willing to humiliate themselves. I'll come back to that, but the first Im imagery is that of someone ready to put themselves down. Now, the, th the other thing is when you go down into a valley, there may be a way down, but there may not be a way up. Isn't that true? You could get down, gravity will help you. But when you're trying to get back out, you might be stuck. And you're not even considering what kind of valley it is. Kulli wadin is nakira, suggesting. I don't even know what kind of valley this is. I don't know if there are snakes down there, dangers down there. I don't know if I'll ever be able to, be able to get out. I don't know, I don't care, I'm going anyway. I'm going anyway. So what is, it's not like Allah is saying, or the Arabs are saying, Specifically here, Allah is saying that the poets love hiking. It's not what the ayah is talking about. It's not saying that they literally go into valleys. It's not what the subject matter is. 
So what is the subject matter? Let's explore this a little bit. You have the entertainment industry today, which was back in the day, the movie industry, the Hollywood of the time, the MTV of the time, the, the entire genre of entertainment of the time was poets. You want to go watch a movie 2,000 years ago? You go nighttime, there's a fire in the middle of the desert, one guy is spitting some rhymes, telling a story, and you're imagining it happening. That's your movie. Okay, you want to go to a concert? Same thing. These guys are your movie industry, they're your music industry, and they were also your philosophers. They were also the philosophy professors at the university, all three of these. But I'll get to the philosophy part at the end. Now for these poets, let's, let's forget about poets of that time, let's think about entertainers, entertainers of our time. They have movies, they have concerts, they have songs, videos, music videos, all this stuff, right? So you have this artist and she comes out with a song and people are watching the YouTube video, people are downloading the MP3, people are listening to it, they're sharing it, they're going crazy over it, it's the song's winning awards and all this kind of stuff. How long does the craze last? How long does a song last? It's okay, you can tell me, I understand. <laughs> huh? A year? Do people listen to the same song for a year? Six months? Three months? Maybe six weeks? I'd say about six weeks. People are crazy. After a while, you hear the same song that you've been listening to for three months, and what do you say to someone who's playing? Can you turn that off? God, I'm tired of it. Enough already. You understand? Like when Frozen came out? <laughs> let it go. Just let it go. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know? A time comes where first you're crazy about it and everybody's loving it and eventually you just get so agitated by it, you don't want to hear it anymore. I'm tired of it. Why? Because in the world of entertainment, the audience always wants something what? New. You get tired of it and you want to move on. Now the thing is with artists, with actors and singers and entertainers, their entire life revolves around them being appreciated. So when people love the song, they're on a high. But when people hate the song, they say, I need to come up with something else. I feel worthless again. I don't care about the money. I don't care about the awards. I just care about my audience hating me now. I need to get back in their attention again. So I have to write another song. I have to perform another song. So, the, you know, she makes another song, the guy comes up with another song, and people say, ah, you know. The first one was good, this one, I don't know. The original movie was pretty good, the sequel, ah, you know, it's kind of bogus. Does it happen? Now this artist is even more desperate, like, oh, I tried to get their attention again, but I failed. I need to try something different. Because they say, I keep doing the same thing over and over again, I have to come up with something different. I have to venture into a new valley. You see what I'm going with this? I have to venture into a new valley. Oh, maybe if I do something really crazy, I'll get attention again. Maybe if I got arrested. Maybe if I did a drug overdose. Maybe if I shaved my head. You know? Maybe if I did this, or, or maybe if I did something so shameless, so scandalous, so disgusting, that even if I, they won't mention me at the award ceremony, at least they will mention me in the tabloids. At least they'll talk about me on Facebook. At least I'll get some attention. Does that cycle happen with artists? Yeah. First they're at the top of the world, then they, they start losing it, then the drugs and the arrests and the craziness. And then eventually some disgusting image of them comes out. You know, they reinvent themselves. And every time they reinvent themselves, they get dirtier and dirtier and dirtier. They keep lowering themselves and lowering themselves and lowering themselves. And just when you think they won't venture into another valley, here's another one. Here's another one. And here's another one. Allah says, didn't you see that they venture off into any valley? 
When people stop listening to their poetry back in the day, they come up with disgusting poetry. They write dirty poetry. They lose their decency because they, they, they think maybe that'll sell better. Let's just lower our standards. And as a result, you know what happens? The standards of an entire society lower. So if you look at singing and song and music and movies and plays from 50 years ago, then you look at them from 40 years ago, then you look at them from 30 years ago, then you go to 20 years and 10 years, and now you will find a, a necessary deterioration in language, in decency, in appropriateness, in shamelessness, there's going to be a, a progression. You'll notice it, you'll see it. It's across cultures. Across cultures. When you have the entertainment industry, it needs to keep reinventing itself. And it, over time, the standards don't go up. The, over time, the standards go down. Until they can't get any lower. Until they just can't get any lower. You know? So now, Allah says about them, these people are just venturing into any valley. They don't care. They don't care about what subject they talk about. What their, you know, what their mission, they don't have no purpose in life. And that's the scary thing to me. These people, Allah is describing, have no purpose. They live for the fans. And you know what's even crazier? The fans live for them. There are people dying for Justin Bieber. They're crying as they're listening to his songs. <laughs> you know? I was just in England last week and the the stadium was actually sold out with a Bieber concert sold out and I just wondered to myself man how many people this kid this kid doesn't even know what his own life means he doesn't he's, people have, his parents have ruined him they've ruined this it's a loss of a human being as far as I'm concerned I feel sorry for him and look at how many people are pinning their hopes on him and they want to be like him and they, oh my God, oh my God. It's such insanity. That that's, that, that's captured in one breath. The entire industry just described in one, one statement. But the Arabs were, not, the poets were not just the entertainers, they were also the philosophers. And that's the next point I want to make. Their philosophy on life and death and afterlife and what they think about, what are their priorities in life, all of it came from poetry. And for us, in, in the modern world, our philosophy sometimes comes from professors of philosophy, your philosophy class. And when you go into your philosophy class, you'll notice that these, in modern philosophy, your philosophers, first of all, they dress strangely, and they, like, they have extra weird glasses, and their hair is all over the place, and they, they say weird things, and they're socially awkward, and all of that, but usually, they also, they just want to instill one thing in you, especially in Western philosophy courses and degrees. They just want to instill one idea in you. There is no such thing as the absolute truth. That's all. If you say this is correct, then they say, what about that, what about that, what about that? When you say that, what about this one? They'll say, oh, no, 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 what if this, what if this, what if this, what if this? They live in the world, what I like to call, they live in the world of what if. They live in the world of what if. So I've, I've met people who say, well, what if your Koran was actually sent by aliens? <laughs> and they're just really smart and they're laughing at you. And I said, no. Well, what if that's true? <laughs> and if you answer that one, they'll say, well, what if? What if your prophet never existed? What if somebody 200 years ago made up an elaborate hoax and sold the world on it? I say, how stupid can you get? <laughs> and they say, well, what if? And they keep, at, and every time you answer one, what if, what, what happens? The next what if, the next what if, they, you, they go into one valley, you pull them out of that valley, what do they do? Jump into the next one, you pull out of that one, you jump into the next one. They live in the world of what if, which has no end. The Qur'an teaches you and me to live in the world of what is, not in the world of what if. Allah asks us not to think about what if, 
Overwhelmingly in the Quran, Allah is saying, look at what is around you. Look at yourself. Look at the reality around you. Look at these ruins of nations that were destroyed. Look at what is. Look at what was. Look at the bird. Look at the tree. Look at your own self. You know, what is. It's a different reality. So if we, we don't venture off into any valley. We have clarity of thought. We have clarity of thought. A lot of you, because, you know, my criticism of myself and my criticism of the Muslim world today is we don't teach clear thinking. How do you think as a Muslim? How do you think as a Muslim? And because we don't give that correct philosophical Quranic foundation of thought, how do you think? How does Allah teach you and me to think correctly? What happens even for Muslims is that they have, their thoughts are all over the place. They also, even Muslims are living in the world of what? If. Instead of living in the world of? What is? Like I tell you, this happens to us all the time, because you know, I'm, you're not in, you're, Alhamdulillah, you're blessed to be in a Muslim country, and you're surrounded by people that are Muslims, and it's really empowering to be here. I feel awesome being here. But when you're living in a place like the United States, and everybody around you is not Muslim, and especially if you're in the East Coast or the West Coast, where people are against religion, generally speaking, and somebody comes up to you and says, you people believe in a horse that can fly? And he took your prophet to the sky? You people believe in that horse? Really? Now a college student who's studying physics and biology and he's studying history, he's intelligent, and he's told, you believe in a flying horse, huh? <laughs> What's he gonna think immediately? Oh, well, uh, mm, actually, uh, you know why he's thinking that? Because his thoughts about Islam are not clear yet. His thoughts aren't clear yet. Somebody comes and asks me, you believe in a flying horse? I say, yeah. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> I do believe in it. <laughs> you believe in a flying horse? I was like, yeah. You want to know why? Let's sit and talk. Let me tell you why I believe in a flying horse. If you want to talk about it, I'm willing to talk to you about it. And while I'm at it, let me ask you some questions. What do you believe? Let me ask you some questions. You ask me a question, let's ask you some questions. Have we prepared our ummah to engage in that conversation? That's not good. Because then there are people who go into every valley and now they're taking the youth into every valley. And the youth don't know. The, youth, the job of the Muslim youth is not to go into every valley. The job of the Muslim youth is to pull people out of these valleys, man. It's the other way. You know? It's heavy. 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 It